Speakers and Cleats, the podcast. Welcome back to the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. It is Friday, October 6th. This is episode 34. I'm Matt Roy. This is Zach Hedrick, who is uh, getting ready for a big weekend for his alma mater. We're ready, man. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait. You've been waiting 360 some odd days for to renew the uh, Red River rivalry for a 49-0 loss last year. Yeah, we won't talk about that one. But, <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, it's the best atmosphere in college football that's it's such a fun stadium to go into and everything so i man i can't wait i wish i was having corn dogs for breakfast on saturday but you i'll can, be working you, i mean you could have corn dogs uh, no it's nothing not. nothing <laughs> surpasses nothing surpasses a fletcher's corny dog I, I i don't even know what that is dude you got to go to the state fair i in mean in oklahoma you, no, you have to go to the Texas State Fair. Oh, Texas State Fair. I've yeah, been there. that's, that, that's where the whole setting is. I've been to the uh, Illinois State Fair. We have Vos corn dogs, and those are also, you know, prestigious so, in the state of Illinois. Quickly, because I know we got a lot to get to, but Texas State Fair, basically everything is fried. But basically, skip the lines. All you need is a Fletcher's corny dog, fried Oreo or funnel cake, whatever you want, and then whatever beverage that you would like to, you know, pair with all that. I had a fried Oreo for the first time at the uh, carnival for Fiesta and I, it changed my life. Yeah. So good. No, <laughs> so good. For me, there's nothing better than a fried Oreo. Funnel cake is up there as well, yeah. but I mean, I if I had a choice, I would go with the fried Oreo. But also you could get a funnel cake with like crushed Oreos on top. There, see, then, there, you there you go. Yeah, and then, never, and then never eat fried food for the rest of the year. <laughs> exactly. So this is episode 34. Uh, I mean, I feel like there's one clear choice with Walter Payton. Well, yeah, well, to keep with the Chicago Bears theme, but if we're going to do more local, I mean, you got to go Shaq, the big diesel, 3-4, yeah. you know, with the Lakers. Also, too, Nolan Ryan, if we're going to go with Rangers, you know, in his, his time there, mm-hmm. seven no-hitters. You know. Yeah, I mean, you have Hakeem Olajuwon as well. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of good 3-4s. Ray Allen. Yeah. And in, in, uh, sorry, Spurs fans for Ray Allen making it, making it on there. Well, uh, I mean, they got redemption the next year, so. It's all right. We both got one. It's fine. And it was what was great was the Hall of Fame weekend. Don asked yeah. Ray Allen, you know, just like, come on, did you travel? And he's like. <laughs> my guy like come on <laughs> let's go <laughs> he's like, i mean the shot went in it was, it, we don't have to worry about it also he didn't travel just for the record um <laughs> i'll leave i'll leave that up for the spurs fans. <laughs> uh they so came back in 24 in get, 2014 excuse yeah, me absolutely but i mean if you think about like who owns the number 34 which is really where the question you know originates it's like walter pay if you be like the greatest of all time person who won the war the number 34 it has to be yeah that's a that's a solid choice and then i think maybe i would think too Shaq might be up there too for this generation yeah. the only problem is that Shaq wore two numbers like 30 he's which 34, one is he 32 34 or 32 you know and yeah. then once he got his later into his career it was 33 and 36 i think when he went to the wait celtics and then when he went to the suns now I'm questioning myself again. So 30, 32, he, that was with uh, that was with the Magic, Magic. And, and the Heat. Okay. And then 34, 34 was, was the, Lakers. the Lakers. And then I think he was 33 with the Celtics. He did kind of bounce around a little and, bit. Yeah. I, or no, 36 with the Celtics. I don't know. Something like that. But I feel like Shaq doesn't really own a number. Hakeem and Walter are like the two yeah. that you're like. Those are good. Yeah. Those are the, those are the best 34s. Right. Yeah. So I'd, I'd go with that one. That's as we okay. alluded to, huge, 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 huge show tonight or show today and huge weekend for texas teams in like all sports it's gonna be so fun it's just ridiculous this is the the kind of weekends that you and i live for Mm -hmm. as sports fans as those in the sports media industry like we just love weekends like this i mean you got utsa who kicks off their aac open uh their their first conference game in the aac against temple Mm -hmm. that's probably like the least significant of all of the games just in terms of like the whole, whole sports landscape because you have the red river rivalry number three against number 12 you have texas a&m playing alabama uh you have the cowboys who are trying to get revenge on the 49ers on sunday night football and then i mean you got the spurs who started training camp you got the rangers and the astros both in the alds i mean that's just it's too much too much 
I, I don't think it's too much. I mean, I, I just love it. It's like bring it all on, you know, right. just let it wash over. We've only got a six minute show, guys. We can't, <laughs> I mean, on, eh. on Fox. <laughs> That's when we just say more time, please. Right, exactly. Let's get to Wemby Mania first. So we're going we're gonna to get a lot of football in. Um, but from the numbers of all of our shows, Wemby obviously does the best, and he's the biggest draw here in San Antonio. So we're going to talk him first. So, Zach, you've been at practice, what, three days, two, two three days this week? Three. What have, What have you seen um, on how they're kind of gelling, on how the attitude of the team is, and just in general? Well, very little in terms of practice. I've seen right. them shoot free throws, <laughs> and so I feel like they will be a very good free throw shooting team. But, no, aside from that, uh, everybody is talking about Wemby's versatility. Um and no matter who you ask, whether it be Doug McDermott, Malachi Branham, Devontae Graham, who we talked to yesterday, it's it's just, yeah, the dude can play everywhere. And his defensive impact, I think, is going to be felt immediately, not just on who he's guarding, but Doug McDermott kind of talked about it. He's just like, yeah, I'm not going to feel as bad getting blown by because I know Vic is going to be back there just being a wall right. at the rim. So that's going to be exciting to see. Now, which combination – are they going to roll out there? Of course, that's the question that everybody wants to know the answer to. It's day three, day four of training camp. It ain't going to happen yet. And, of course, we're going to get the silver and black scrimmage tomorrow out at the Frost Bank Center. Fans will get to see it, you know, and, and I think it'll be a lot like an exhibition, you know, just a, kind of an all-star <laughs> game kind of feel where we're going to see some crazy dunks and all that kind of stuff or, you know, just some eye-opening things that maybe Victor might do. Uh, and of course, whatever lineup they trot out there, you know, then everybody can chew over that for the next few days before the preseason game right. against OKC. So, I mean, it, this team is young and hungry, and I really think it's a good mix of young guys and veterans. Now, I know they still probably have to trim down one roster spot, but who that will be, I don't know. Um, and, and really the veteran guys, it's like it's not like they're old, old veterans. Right. You know, it's like they, they still got some mileage in them a little bit. Right. You know, Doug McDermott, you know, it's it's like he's it's like hey, I feel kind of bad. Like you right. call me old. Like come on now. They don't have like a Vince Carter on their team. No, you know? it's, it's 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 not, not a like, Sean Marion. You know, yeah. at thirty eight years old for the Mavericks. It's you not know, Kevin it's, Love on their no, team right now. No. It's just like Doug McDermott was eighth eighth year, not yeah. something like that. He's, like he's not hugely old. He's not over the hill. You know, no, what I mean? no, no, like no. It's, it's kind of funny how, how everything is kind of going towards like all oh, those crafty veterans. It's Doug McDermott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like well, I still remember him at Creighton. Like <laughs> Yeah. And Chetty and Chetty Osman too, yeah. who I got to talk to on media day a little bit. You know, there's, there's a lot of competitive depth, but I think the big thing is they're looking for guys who can make contributions on both sides of the floor defense, obviously last year lacking severely lacking in that category for the Spurs. They definitely want to see guys who can step it up on that end. Yeah, and something that like I just noticed is it, they really seem to be embracing, one, embracing Wemby, but two, just kind of embracing the what he's bringing in terms of culture to the Spurs. And like it's a bunch of young kids that are going to be grown up together all at once. Yeah. And, and so that's it, the exciting part. Exactly. Right? And it seems like it's, it's a lot of like – we don't know what we can do yet, so how are we supposed to tell you what we don't know we, what we can do? Because it seems like all of them are figuring out their own way to mesh together. Mm -hmm. And in all of the press conferences, at least, and, and from everything I've seen, it seems like they're all embracing the Wemby mania as well. Yeah, and Coach Pop talked about that the first day. <laughs> it was just kind of like, you know, hey, we're just going to see how this all rolls out. I mean, you know, we'll leave them to their own devices. Maybe we'll address some things here and there as they crop up. But it's like we're not going to come in with a set plan of you can or cannot do this. It's just like it's it's kind of a, a maiden voyage for everybody. You know, it's just like let's just see what happens. And, yeah, if there's people up on the team bus or something like that, yeah, we got to get them off or whatever. Right. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, other than that, you know, it's just like uh, every, I think everybody's kind of on the same page. And. And Victor, too, it's like he's he said it himself. He's just like, look, I don't care about this. It's like I want to go play basketball. It's like, yeah, it the attention, whatever, it's cool. But it's like we're here to pl play basketball and get better. And to that point, a lot of the talk has been like, how good can Wemby be since he's been drafted? And I think the underrated aspect is how much he had to deal with in in europe i mean he had he said it earlier this week and we're going to hear the bite right now that he just had so much on his plate that was outside of basketball mm -hmm. and now 
it's the structure of the NBA. It's the structure of the Spurs that's kind of saving him from having to do that. And he now he can just focus on ball, which is what he wants to do. So let's hear that thought real quick, and then we'll come back. I got to worry about a, a ton of less stuff. <laughs> you know, last year, last year I wasn't just a player. I was also a, a GM. You know, I had to make sure the, the, the floor was clean before we had to practice. I had to make sure my teammates were lifting. Now it's I'm really more free. When I come in the morning, I know there's going to be physios and coaches to take care of me, no matter the, the hour of the day. And my mind is, is, a, is more at rest than last year. So if he was good with all those stresses in his life, having to worry about you know, his teammates working out and motivating everybody besides himself, how good can he be when he's not doing that? And it seems like the sky's the limit. Yeah, it's going to be a tremendous load off for him. And that was kind of the eye-opening thing to me was just how much he had to worry about you know, with his team over in France. Like cleaning and, the floor? Right. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but um, now with you know, and, uh, having that, all the support staff that an NBA team does – and, and it's you automatically think of like, you know, a shooting coach and, and the trainers and all the guys that help these guys recover and stuff like that. But there's all the guys behind the scenes too, like the, the video analysis and breaking film down and all and everything, giving them the numbers that they need of, hey, this team likes to run this defensive set or this, you know, out of bounds play in a certain situation like this. That's going to just help him immensely. Yeah, absolutely. And having having the structure of a team like the Spurs who have done this for so long have mm -hmm. developed players that they have and, and have gotten really when you look at the the paradox of the NBA they've gotten the most out of what they have at almost every position throughout the last 25 years or so like their development is where the Spurs thrive and having that project I'll say for lack of a better term um, of Wemby is like giving them the ultimate development prize yeah I mean because every Guy, you know, it, it, whether it's been Tim, David Robinson, even Kawhi Leonard, you know, it's just Pop said it. It's just like, I, I don't know what he's going to do. It's right. like, a, we, I want to see what he can, <laughs> I want to see how he plays. We're as excited and as then, you guys. <laughs> and then we'll figure out what we need to put around him and, you know, who plays where and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And as far as the who plays where scenario of it, everyone wants to know, like, is he going to play center? Is he going to play one, two, three, four, five? And, thing is he can play all of them so that's yeah. why nobody that's why nobody knows but uh Wemby was asked a little bit earlier I think it was Wednesday um where he's gonna play but I mean he doesn't know either and uh let's let's hear from him real quick I'm playing the same sometimes the same role as Trey Jones sometimes uh, the same as Zach Collins sometimes as Devin Vassell is you know it's there's really no limitations so and on a lot of set plays on a lot of of place it really depends on where you are it's, but i can be the i can be the point guard just like i can i can be the the wing it doesn't matter today's nba a seven six point guard or seven four point guard yeah seven four <laughs> seven five whatever whatever is. whatever he is like anywhere from seven three to seven six with shoes on seven seven something point guard so guard that dame lillard <laughs> yeah, I think it's certainly possible. You know, it's it's. There's even been an idea floated out there that Jeremy Sohan might, you know, run point or something. Yeah, like. that one's so really interesting. It's just it's really positionless basketball. Like I think LeBron maybe started that movement just because it's like you know he he plays a three or a four whatever it is, but it's like he can really you know morph into a yeah. one or a two whatever it is whoever's out there on the floor. So. I, you know, where he plays, I think that's just, it's because the NBA still has that silly thing of you need to have two guards and two forwards yeah. and a center and stuff, but it's really, it doesn't matter where it's just, it's just, man, just go out there and, you know, have fun right. because it is going to be fun to watch. Right. I want to see when, when the NBA voters, when they vote for all pro team or uh, all NBA teams, excuse me, they have to pick two guards, a center and two forwards. I want to see like what he's qualified to be voted for mm -hmm. in, after this year. Just like, I don't know if he's going to make an all NBA team. He probably won't in all likelihood, but like, I want to see what category they put him in just to see like, all right, we can vote Wemby in at point guard. I think they could do that last year with um, Luca. Luca was like, where the hell do we put him? Do we mm -hmm. put him at forward? Do we put him at guard? Like no one knows. Yeah. But to your point, this is the modern NBA. I mean, it all, it all kind of started in the eighties when, when magic jumped center and, 
won them an NBA championship yeah. So it, it, with L.A., but going to where we are now, you don't know where you're going to play. You don't really care where you're going to play. It's just about spacing on the floor and making sure that everybody is in the right position, and there's nobody better to do that than Pop. So mm -hmm. um, last thing before we get to football today on the Spurs, ESPN came out with their um, win projections today for the NBA. Don't know why they're doing it three weeks before, two weeks before the season starts, but usually you do that right before the season starts. But anyway, the Spurs were given the worst record, worst projected record in the NBA with around 26 wins, worse than the Rockets, worse than the Blazers, worse than the Pistons. I don't buy it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't buy it. I think that if they had, if they end the season with the 26 wins, this would be a catastrophic failure of a season, in my opinion. Because you have all of these young guys who have been developed through, throughout the last few years. This is a show-me year for Keldon. This is a show-me year for Devin Vassell, who just got a big contract. This is a show-me year for how seeing how much Jeremy Sh Sh Shohan has – I always pronounce his name wrong. <laughs> Shohan has um, uh, developed over the last year and a half. Like, if they end up with 26 wins, there's going to be some monster changes next offseason. Yeah, and I think maybe – the organization kind of expects that just because it's like it that they will have have had Wimby for one full NBA season mm -hmm. and it's like okay now we have a body of work that we can go off of mm -hmm. and see okay what next move do we make who do we keep who do we move that sort of thing um t so 26 is what they went with 26 point something yeah okay I just not having had any preseason games being played or anything like that I I put that as very low i would say that the spurs are at least like a 34 35 win team just yeah. you know off the jump now that may go up or down depending on you know just what they look like in the preseason and everything like that yes it is a young team and they're gonna have to figure out how to play with each other but what better i mean they've already been doing that in the summer and the excitement's up there these guys you know they keep hinting at it you know they're not coming out and saying it but it's just like man just you know the, the the competition's been up so just wait until we get out there right and you hear it in everyone's comments you hear it in everyone's voices they're here to win this year mm -hmm. like pop said it day one he, this last year was about development this year's about winning and the future years are going to be about winning like it's not not about development sure. now but even if Wemby comes out and is strictly a defensive stalwart which we i think we all understand he's going to be from the jump and his offensive game doesn't really translate. Maybe it takes a half a season to get there because of the speed and the strength and whatnot of the NBA. I still think the floor for this team is like 32 wins. Mm -hmm. The ceiling is like 45, mm -hmm. 46. But they're a fringe playoff team, in my opinion, no matter yeah. no matter how well Wemby plays. They, if they could have probably won 26 games last year if they wanted to win half the games that they lost. Yeah, I, maybe even you know more than that. Right. You know, but... And, and, yeah, of course, winning's the goal. It's not to say that there's going to be some games where, yeah, they're up or something like that, and then the other team, you know, makes a comeback. And, and this team needs to learn how to, to close games, especially with, you know, the combination that they have out there on the floor with Wimby out there. So there, there's still going to be a learning curve. There's going to be some frustrations a little bit, you know, this season where it's like, ah, you know, they, they could have had that game. Why didn't they? That's where I think that that real growth is going to happen, where it's like, OK, yeah, we, we, you know, that one got away from us. What what do we do better to, you know, move forward and make sure that doesn't happen again? You also have to take into account that this team has to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. So, like, I get that some of the games that they have that maybe they're up by 20 in the fourth quarter, they don't end up winning because they don't know how to close out those games. They're they still have bad habits from last year that have to be broken of where they lost big leads in the fourth quarter seemingly every single night yeah and so you have to kind of learn how to win but 26 wins is is like bottom of the barrel that that means that somebody got really really hurt that Keldon didn't uh come out and be the leader that we all know he, that he is that he didn't develop that means that Devin Vassell plateaued and didn't take the next jump that they think he's going to take that means that a whole bunch of a, a litany of things went wrong for this team that I to be honest, I just don't see it happening. Yeah, I think you kind of touched on it. It's just barring a couple of huge key losses via injury or whatever else, I I don't see 20. No. 26 is a very, very low 
uh, floor for right. for this team. I I think they surpass that no problem. Absolutely, I think they'll I think they'll surpass that by like sixty games. Like that's I don't know that I saw that today and I was I was making the rundown and I was like seriously, yeah. I just kept scrolling. I kept scrolling to <laughs> the, and it was the Spurs all the way at the bottom. I was like, what the hell just happened? Or kind maybe some, maybe my... somebody doesn't like the Spurs over there at ESPN. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was their BPI or something. I don't know. But let's get to uh, let's get some football. So right at the 20 minute mark. I'm right on schedule here, guys. This is like a first time. Um, <laughs> the Cowboys Niners. This is the probably the biggest game of the NFL season so far for any team. Yeah. Um, Cowboys have the or the, excuse me, the Niners have the Cowboys number and they have for years. Um, Last year in the playoff game, last time we saw these two teams, the Cowboys were playing well, and then Tony P got hurt, and it all kind of went to hell in a handbasket. So wh- how do you see this game in Santa Clara playing out the as you're up there in the press box watching it? That's the thing. It, it's These are two evenly matched teams, I think. It's whoever can get a turnover. Two is asking for a lot with these two quarterbacks Brock yep. Purdy has taken care of the football so is Dak I mean I know he had that horrible interception in the Arizona game but it's just one one pick through four games I think a lot of NFL teams would take that absolutely uh so can this defense still play with their hair on fire bottle up Christian McCaffrey and all their other offensive weapons which is going to be tough to do and then If they do get that interception, can the Cowboys, can Dak on the offense capitalize on it and drive it into the end zone, not in with three points? It's like this is a game where it's just like each time you touch the ball, you need a touchdown, and there's there's no way around it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the key to the game is you have to score in the red zone, and that's been the problem all year. Last year, Dallas was the number one team in the red zone in terms of touchdown percentage. This year, they're 30th, Mm -hmm. and so – when you're only scoring six points on 33% of your red zone possessions, it's a huge issue, especially when you're going up against a team that has the embarrassment of riches when it comes to firepower on their offense and a defense that is extremely assignment sound and knows exactly what they're trying to do and executes it at a, at a very high level. And you brought up Tony Pollard getting hurt. I think this is, you know, if, if, again, barring any injuries for the Cowboys, I think this is where maybe we can really see the offense start to, you know, kind of really flex their muscle a little bit. I know it's kind of been slow going. Yes, they have had sustained drives. You know, they when they're on their game, they are they have like what, 11, 12, 13, even 14 play drives and stuff that ended points. Mm-hmm. And that's really good for game control and stuff and, and helps your defense out, getting them rest and everything. But I really think, you know, of course, they're going to be keying on CD. But then it's like you saw Michael Gallup have a really good game last week. He made some big catches, some conversions, Jake Ferguson as well. Again, it's just them showing up in the red zone. Uh, and I think uh, Lipke down there, I think he might be your kind of goal line x factor or something like that there was a play too against the patriots where Dak pulled the ball on a on a option read or something like that jake ferguson was out blocking um because i think he motioned over or something like that and if Dak had pulled the ball it would have been a stroll in the end zone <laughs> i mean like jake ferguson jake ferguson turned around like looked at that and was like dude come on like oh it's like it was like that was main street we had it um you know, I can't remember what quarter that was in, but it's it's just I think Dak will have to make some plays, some running plays. Yeah, which, absolutely. You know, in the red zone, it just just show it a couple times. You know, where it's like, yeah, we can do this too, and then that way that should open up some other guys. Uh, you know, tight ends and and you know Lipke, the fullback, to where they can they can get in the end zone. It's going to have to come down to if to how healthy and how many guys play on the uh, Dallas offensive line as well. Because right now it seems like everyone might play. It Trending might, the right way. This might be one of the games where they have their entire offensive line starting. Yeah. And that would be huge coming off against a, a Nick Bosa-led defensive line that just wreaks havoc in the backfield. Yeah. So if if they have everybody, one, that helps your run game tremendously, which thus far this year has been pretty piss poor for the Cowboys like they haven't been able to get their running game going Tony Pollard I know as a fantasy owner hasn't done very well and (laughs) just because he hasn't scored touchdowns I I, I mean I I, 
the the run he's, game he's I feel like has been a, either, though. yeah well against the Patriots yeah maybe not but I mean it it I think it's been effective they've they've managed to move the ball yeah it's it's not Tony Pollard being a bell cow right because he's not built for that uh, of course Rico Dowdle you know they need to watch his hip and everything like that I've heard some good things I've seen and read some good things about them that he should be available uh, he he's been a good changeup for for TP. So we'll see. And then because you had Cavante Turpin like on an end around make make a big huge play in the run game too. So it's it's not all on Tony Pollard. They kind of give the ball to you know other playmakers. Even CD had like a twelve yard run or something like that. So it's they try and move it around a little bit in the run game. So yeah, it's not all on on Pollard, but. Yeah, if if they can all be healthy, that'd be huge. I mean, but Dak had a good bite about it yesterday where it's just, you know, last time we talked about it, it didn't happen. So let's let's wait and see what happens on Sunday, and then we'll right. talk about it. I mean, how, how the D-line steps up against the Niners O-line is going to be interesting as well because the 49ers are a run-first team, especially mm -hmm. with Brock Purdy back there. They're a run-first play action outside zone team. Outside zone is kind of plays nicely into what the Cowboys are trying to do. Inside zones where they have trouble at, at defensive tackles, stopping those those guard center double blocks up to the linebacker, and so I don't know whether the uh, Niners are going to try and prey on that and put kind of put McCaffrey in spots where he can run up the middle. They can block out Mozzie and and get to those get inside and then break it out, um, or if they're going to do exactly what all the other teams have done and run directly at Michael Parsons and say, right. all right, stop us. Yeah, that's that's the kind of stymie, isn't it, yeah. to, to slow him down. It's it's a big game for, yeah, those D tackles. Jonathan Hankins, Mozzie Smith, Neville Gallimore. Neville Gallimore made some nice plays against the Patriots, but, again, it's it's the Patriots' offense. So, you know, you, you kind of take, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Right, a little, a little bit, but, I mean, it's like you still got to make the play. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a big game for those defensive tackles. Can they – eat up enough space to let the linebackers, Leighton Van Der Esch, Micah Parsons, Damone Clark, Donovan Wilson from a safety spot come up and make plays in the run game. Can Deron Bland replicate what he did this past week on a consistent basis against, especially against a team like the Niners, where they have Debo who goes everywhere on the field, Brandon Ayuk who goes everywhere on the field. They have Juwan Johnson who kind of plays in that slot role. Like how good can Deron Bland be in a game like this instead of, in an inept offense, let's just be honest, like the Patriots are. Yeah, well, I, I'll say this: Deron Bland is is going to be going in playing with a lot of confidence because it's like <laughs> the guy has what eight interceptions, and that's the most in the league since yeah. he came in eight and twenty last games. year. So it's just like the dude makes the plays. Like, yeah, it's against offense. Like he had a two pick game last year against the Colts. It's the Colts, but it's just like you still got to make the play. It's if it's thrown your way, you got to catch the ball. And he's doing it so far. So we'll, we'll see what Deron Bland does. I'm curious to – I'm interested to watch him. But so far, you know, he's come in and it's just like, you know, hey, it, we're going to be just fine without Trayvon Diggs. Yeah. I mean, that first game without Trayvon was probably like a – it was a shock to the system against the Cardinals, yeah. really. It's, it was like you lose your star player on a Thursday right before you come – right in the middle of your game planning. And so you know, now you need to kind of adjust everything. Duran needs to move outside instead of playing in the slot. It's like right. everything kind of gets thrown up in the air. So I get why something like that could happen. Last week they stepped up, on, especially defensively, against the Patriots. But as inept as the Patriots are on offense at, at most times during this season, I don't know what you can take from that. And that's my biggest thing as we move into – a game against a top NFC opponent is that the pay or the Cowboys haven't played anybody yet this season. They haven't played a tough game um, right. yet or against the top team. They've played bottom 12 teams throughout this entire season. It'll be fascinating to see where this team is against this Niners team, who I think everyone anoints as, as either the top team or the second team in the NFC. Yeah. And it's a, it's a big game for, for Dak Prescott. It's not a make or break game because it's it's week five. But as you said, it's a huge game just to see where do they stack in the entirety of the NFC. Yeah. So it's a litmus test. Yeah. And you know, a lot's been said. Jerry Jones said it, you know, <laughs> even though they're not, you know, in the conversation yet, we're we're way far away from playoffs, but it's like, oh well, San Francisco has to go up through us. Well, 
past two seasons, Jerry, San Francisco has gone through you in right. the playoffs. So, but also, uh, and also you look at it, this would put them at three and two, the Cowboys, and that puts you two games behind the Eagles um, yeah. already this early. So you, even even though we're in week five, you're still counting wins sometimes. Oh, yeah. And where, no, you you, gotta, where you got to co- make n- some up. Now is the time to put them in the bank because, again, the back half of the Cowboys schedule after the bye week, it's, it's just, yeah, it's tough. And, and you know, you have the Rams, and then I think after that, what it's like either Commanders or Eagles or something Eagles, like that. Eagles, I think. So they played. I know they. Yeah. I don't yeah. Remember, no. But. Yeah. No. Ram. Uh, no. Yeah. You're. You're. You're right. After the bye week, Rams, and then or no, excuse me. Um, after the bye week, there's somebody else. But then, yeah, that that first game in November, it's the Eagles, and so that's that's the next big test. Yeah. So it's, it's from here. It's Niners, Chargers next week on Monday night. Bye week. Bye week. Rams, Rams. Eagles. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Giants at home. Then they have the Panthers, Commanders, Seahawks, Eagles. Okay, so Panthers, you can you know maybe go ahead and maybe chalk that. In a win. Chalk that one up just just barely. Um, you know, again, we'll see how they're playing. That's more than a month away. But again, so yeah, big test this week. Your next one big, is coming big up test next week. Yeah, you're you're, and then but the big one is of course the Eagles. You know, you you, you gotta you gotta win your division and and win those division games because yeah. yeah, like you said, if you lose this one, now you're two back of the Eagles and and now you're playing catch up, and you hope that the Eagles trip up somewhere. And you have to at least split with the Eagles this season just to even have a chance at the NFC East. So. Yeah. Uh, the line is currently minus four, four, four points it favored uh, the Niners are. So give it, give it to me. Who, who wins? Who wins by how much? Uh, I'm going. So I, everybody's been talking about this one has extra juice. And I think them having lost to the 49ers the past two seasons, the, t- the the guys that are still there from those teams, Dak Pres- Prescott mainly, you know, he he kind of has been talking about it even after the New England win. He's playing pissed off, like you know. In right. the past, we had nice guy Dak, and now he's just like, no, we're, we're enough of this. It's like we're we're here to you know, kick butt and take names. <laughs> so it's like they're playing with an edge. I think it's going to be twenty four twenty one Cowboys. Ooh. Okay, I think it's going to be twenty eight sixteen Niners. That's that's healthy. That's I, <laughs> that well, is a I'm, healthy I'm, I'm like chalking, beat down. I'm chalking in three field, red zone field goals into that. That's why I came, where I came up with sixteen. <laughs> yeah, that's almost that's almost that's even worse than the January loss in the divisional round. I just I don't know. It's something about this Niners team. The Niners this year are just killing people and i feel like i feel like last year they kind of threw brock purdy in and he played really well uh and it was a surprise now they've had all off season to kind of yeah he's say he's ensconced he's he's ensconced in that system he knows it and he again it's like Dak now in mike mccarthy's offense you don't have to go out and throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns it's just make the plays that are there and we're and we're going to get where we need to be Right, and that's exactly what Brock Purdy's doing with the 49ers. When, when it comes to how uh, spicy Dak Prescott has been, re- just real quick, did you see on Twitter this week uh, that he's dating a yes. Latina now? And he's like, no okay. wonder he's been spicy with the media. He's dating a Latina now. Yeah, that that that's going on with the social it was media. So that's, funny. That's the latest social media kind of uh, <laughs> side story there, which is yeah. It, it, there's a little <laughs> chuckles there, you know, in that. I mean, no offense to any Latinos out there. You guys are just spicy. Um, let's get to UTSA real quick. I mean, they were on a bye week last week. They're finally starting to get healthy. They're starting the a- their AAC schedule now. Um, Frank Clark still a game time decision against Temple mm-hmm. on Saturday. I think even if they don't have him, they should expect to win this game. However, you want your you want your workhorse for the first game of this of this district schedule or this. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking district because of high school. Right, right, right. This conference schedule. Yeah, I th- I would think he would, during the bye week, it sounded like he was going to go, Frank was going to go. Um, of course, this, you know, when I was there at UTSA practice, Coach Trailer was just kind of like, we'll see, you know, playing the whole gamesmanship, right. you know, cards close to the vest and all that kind of stuff. As he does. Sure. And every coach in, in, in the college ranks does. Right. So... I think he plays. 
you know, it's, it's what, three weeks off now, you know, that toe, it may not be completely healed at all this season, but it's like a 90%, 95% Frank Harris is better, is much better than a 75% Frank Harris or, you know, so, um, and it's, and it's, of course, you mentioned Frank and JT Clark, JT should also be getting the green light. It's, it's the offensive line where they're still kind of battling those injuries up front. You got to be able to protect Frank and give him time or else, you know, it's like you need to move him out of the pocket, hopefully, and, and just give him a little bit of space to make those throws and open up those lanes a little bit. So um, if not, then, hey, let's go with McCown and, and let him, you know, sling it around a little bit. You know, it's a lefty, too, so that should – it shouldn't change up the game plan too much. Did McCown take over for ELM as the backup, primary backup? Now? I No, it didn't seem like to me. I mean, I think Coach Trailer has said it's just like, hey, we're, we're happy with these two quarterbacks that we got here. Right. And, and moving forward, you know, that's something to, you know, kind of hang our hat on a little bit after they got through the non-conference schedule. So I, I don't think it's like an overtake or anything like that because um, Eddie Lee, you know, throws a great deep ball. Uh, so I think that's a weapon that, you know, they, they like to have as well. I think there's something to be said about, like, bringing in that lefty and, and having McCown kind of come in and be able to run the same kind of offense. You still run everything the same kind and, of – And same call, yeah. You run everything the same, side, the the same side, exactly. I mean, it, it, it kind of – the continuity between Frank and, and Owen is probably a little bit easier than Frank to ELM just because you're switching sides, and people might not think that's a big deal. But when you open up as a quarterback – and your and your shoulder comes back in in your righty. It's easier to throw to the open side of the field to you than close your shoulders and flip your hips and go the other way. Right. So, um, what do you think happens with this game? They're fourteen point favorites right now, coming off the bye, uh, in in Temple in Philadelphia, Lincoln Financial. So, what happens? I think if I I, I really need to see something from the defense because they they played well in Houston and then you know Texas State same thing but then Army and Tennessee they kind of you know took a, yeah. a took a step back or two so that to me is really what I'm focused in on is is the defense can they get back their identity of you know playing lockdown stopping the run and and giving more chances to Frank in the offense. Yeah, I feel like Army just kind of like took their soul from them a little bit. It was just run after run after run, holding the ball for forty three minutes, and you're just like, God, and that's you stop. But that's Army's. No, I mean I'm not saying it, it's a great game plan by Army. I'm just saying that they they kind of like took the identity away from UCSA's defense. Yeah, I mean it, you know, and and Army's been doing that to teams all over the country just because it's they are so good at that system and what they run and everything. But, um, yeah, I think really this is a chance for UTSA to kind of you know reforge their identity and get back to what they do best, which is stopping the run, running the football, and playing great special teams. And they do that, and they're going to be they're they're going to be walking out of Lincoln financial field with a win yeah i think they win i think they cover i think that this is a get right game for them uh, mm -hmm. in general and um i would be surprised if this game ends with the not a double digit win by the utsa it just seems like one of those games that you have to win yeah you have to win this game to even have a semblance of a season that we thought you were going to have and well and they've been talking about it ever since yeah. you know after the army game and even tennessee it's just like look we're we're o and o and the goal is to to win a conference championship. So it begins up there in Philly uh, Saturday afternoon, and I think they get it done as well. Let's get to the Red River rivalry, which I will not say again because I don't want to mess <laughs> up. Um, I'm just going to set this up and kind of tee the ball up for you and then and then let the Sooner come out. But three number three, Texas against number 12, Oklahoma. Longhorns lead the all-time series 63-50-1. Both teams undefeated in the matchup for the first time since 2011. The last time they will be in the Big 12 last year, 49-0 Texas, but Dylan Gabriel did not play in that game. He's having a hell of a year. He missed the last game with a concussion. The matchup could not be any bigger. No. It's really great and, of course, fitting that it's the last <laughs> year for these programs in the Big 12. I mean, you take OU and Texas away, and what has the Big 12 done? The rest of the Big 12 teams Baylor's are – Baylor's really good. Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> I forgot about them. No, um, but the rest of the Big Twelve, you know, it's it's been, ugh, yeah, you know, so, yeah, 
you can't you can't dream of a better scenario for for OU Texas fans going into this game. Like you mentioned last time, they were ranked and undefe- or undefeated both both programs. 2011, I was at that game by the way. And at 55 17, they had like <laughs> the counting. sooner the Sooners had three defensive touchdowns in that game, if I do recall correctly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so were that one in, were you in school at that time oh yeah yeah i was oh, there, you were there two, 2000 student. yeah 2009 through 2013 ah, so that was okay. a, so you remember very well yes i do <laughs> um first year that was when sam bradford went down in the very first game at jerry world against byu had a shoulder injury he tried to come back in the ou texas game in 2009 against colt mccoy it wasn't happening but then after that we won all the my last three years there in school so fantastic anyway listen to the we we won we, heck yeah <laughs> come on i mean i mean there's nothing better so and of course it was a privilege to be in the marching band all, you know those four years the whole band goes the the longhorn band is there as well it's just a it's there's no better atmosphere in, in college football it is fantastic it's a situation where you can actually feel the momentum swing from one end of the stadium of the other and it's it's so like I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it just because it's just like, man, when you feel it swing the other way, it's just like a gut punch. But then when it comes back your way and, and your half of the stadium is loud and, and cheering and high fiving and stuff like that, it, it's just like, man, we can do no wrong. Right. So it's a lot of fun. Now, going back to this season, this matchup on Saturday, I give Texas an edge. Now, I, ooh, wow. Sooner, it's They're because a better team right now. They are. Sarkeesian, year three. Venables, year two. That's the difference in it right now. Um, both quarterbacks are playing fantastic ball, so it's going to be really fun to see. I'm hoping that both of these guys, it's a clean game. There's no injuries or anything like that because you want these programs to be going at it full strength. Uh, Jonathan Brooks has been running with reckless abandon. They have a really a one-two punch. They've got another running back, too, that, is, that has been solid for Texas as well. The defense has been improved for Oklahoma, so I don't think it's going to be a blowout. Um, it's going to be a back-and-forth battle. It really comes down to, I think, the offensive line. I don't think Oklahoma gets the pressure on on Quinn Ewers just because they don't have the pass rush right. just yet that they need. They're getting there, but it hasn't happened just yet. And I think Quinn Ewers, um, if he takes care of the football, that should be fine. But if, if Oklahoma wins the turnover battle, that's where the door opens to where it's like, okay, and now it's anybody's game. Yeah, to me, it looks like Oklahoma just, like, as good as they've been this season, they haven't impressed me because they haven't played anybody. Like, yeah, that's fair. SMU is your, probably your biggest win, maybe Cincinnati. Uh, you beat them by 14. SMU, I think it was a 28-11 game, something like that. Um, they just haven't played anybody yet, so I don't know what they can do because when you're playing someone that's kind of the cream of the crop and sh- has an argument to be the number one team in the country in mm-hmm. Texas mm-hmm. – you need to, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's, and it doesn't. I don't know if they can in that level of competition yet. Which that's the only holdup I have for this being like a close game, and close. I mean, within the two possessions, one possession, whatever it is, I just don't know if it can be that close just because they haven't done it yet against a big opponent. Like the Cowboys going against the Forty yeah, Niners, exactly. the, the, the Sooners are getting a good litmus test and measuring stick against the Longhorns. Where are they exactly in terms of getting this? you know ball rolling down the way they want it to go and even texas against the uh cupcakes on their schedule they haven't played with their food they came out smashed baylor they came out i mean they played around with wyoming for a little bit but they they've been coming out and killing people in the way that they should be uh as one of the top teams in the country the only i mean alabama was a 10 point win i think yeah and then, it was double digits. Wy- and then wyoming was pretty close going into the fourth quarter they ended up running away with, with it but it doesn't seem like they've played around with their food and they've kind of come out they've punched people in the mouth and they've been like you know what? we're the better team we're going to win this game yeah the final scores have you know seemed to shown that a little bit wyoming they they came out a little flat and you know it, it kind of of course they exploded in the fourth right. quarter and, and distanced themselves they did that with kansas as well and see that's where the depth comes in uh, it's the difference between year three for Sark and year two for Coach Venables. You know, they, they have just a little bit more than a two deep. Texas is maybe three deep in some areas, especially up on those lines, defensive line especially, where they can keep rolling fresh guys in and keep relentless, you know, pass rush and pressure up. And that's, I think, you know, a big difference going into this one. What's the final score? Ooh. 
<laughs> um, I'm going to go. Keep in mind, Texas favored by five and a half. Right. I think it's five and a half today. It, start, it opened at six and a half, but five and a half now. You know, it's, oh, my gosh, this one's always so tough. You know, the, the sooner in me wants to say, oh, it's going to be, you know, 42 to 14 or whatever. Uh, but pragmatic, that's that's what. That's what my <laughs> that's what my school pick is. 42 14 Sooners. But pragmatically, <laughs> pragmatically, uh from from my point as a sports journalist, I'm going to go 31 28 OU. Really? I think it's man, it's a toss up. I really I really think um you know, it, it the schemes that Coach Venables can have on defense. I think they make just enough plays, and I think they win. I think maybe Texas has a special teams mess up. They they had that against yeah, Baylor. Yeah, they haven't been playing very well. Now, they, now their kicker hasn't been very good either. Bert Auburn, yeah, that's that's going to be a question mark too. You know, is, is if it comes down to a Bert Auburn kick, you know, ew, I don't know how Longhorns fans are feeling about that one. <laughs> is he nine for fourteen this year? Something, uh, like, something, something like that. It's, it it's not, hasn't it been hasn't great, been but I mean, Coach Sark has said no, we're we're not making a change at, at you know with, with at kicker. We're going to ride with Bert, so they've got confidence in their guy, which which I give props for. Um, I just think, you know, maybe there's a big special teams play in there that swings OU's way and I think that might be the difference in the game I don't I don't if if either quarterback throws two interceptions whichever quarter which whichever team has the two interceptions that they get from the other quarterback they're winning the game so win the turnover battle exactly I mean it, that's I feel like that's what it normally comes down to in this game I'm gonna go I think it's 30 to 23 late in the fourth and then a turnover seals Oklahoma's fate ends up being 37 23 Texas yeah the, uh, the over under is right about 60 and a half Vegas makes a lot of money because they're really 60. close on the 60 and a half yeah mm. so I think I think that kind of Texas put some pressure on them in the fourth quarter and, and ends up pulling away like they have most of the games. This yeah, season. that's what they've done these past few games yep. uh, against Baylor and Kansas. So that that could happen again. That's, yeah, third and fourth quarter, if it's close, that's that's when Texas maybe kind of, you know, flexes their muscle and, and kind of distances themselves. But if Oklahoma's up by a couple scores, it, it's anybody's ball game. If Oklahoma's up by a couple scores, this, I mean, I think it's going to be a really good game regardless, but it's, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait for the headache in the fourth quarter, which will be around four o'clock when it's tight and it's just we're going to be yelling at the TV. Yeah, you're, <laughs> it's a good thing that it's an eleven o'clock game and not a uh, three o five game or whatever it is, because then you'd be you'd be on set. I'm, just like I may well no, I I may be hoarse by the time we're we're reading everything for the for the sports cast. <laughs> well, let's get to the Aggies and Alabama real quick. Another huge matchup. Uh, win for A and M would put them on track to win the sec west pretty much with with lsu losing to ole miss and lsu doesn't doesn't have anybody on their defense who can stop anybody so i think lsu and everybody that was picking them to make the uh make the uh, college football playoff is is kind of licking their wounds now at this point and regretting that pick but alabama since they lost to texas has kind of come back and, and started playing some good football but a&m came out and really impressed last week with how they beat arkansas i know arkansas is horrible um and just not really a good good football team at this point however without their starting quarterback they come out and they put up a good number against arkansas and end up showing like hey we're still not to be trifled with here at, mm -hmm. at texas a&m yeah max johnson played well he yeah. has you know since coming over from lsu uh he did have throw his first interception as an aggie it was a pick six but you know he recovered well from that and to steal a term from Mike McCarthy the Aggies have been playing they have been playing complimentary football you know they they've been getting it on special teams and defense good play and everything in the past couple of weeks they've wrapped up like six seven sacks or something yep. like that so um and and that's something with Alabama's quarterback I think it's Milrow again they, they've kind of went back and said okay Jalen's our guy Jalen Milrow who yep. played against Texas um if the Aggies can get a good pass rush because against Texas, you saw Milrow, you know, he, he went back, and if it wasn't there, he was taking off running. Yep. So if they can get pressure on Jalen and and flush him out and stuff and, and make him a runner, 
Uh, Texas A&M does have a shot. Now, Johnson, Max Johnson is going to have to take care of the football this one. It helps that it's at Kyle Field. So that I give, you know, of course, Texas A&M a bit of an edge. Uh, but, you know, going up against Jimbo, Nick Saban's going to have his guys ready. And and um, it's, I think this one's going to be close. Another close one. Yeah. Should be a toss-up. Um you know, this, it, this it, one's this one's always kind of like a extra juice game, yeah. especially especially with A and M and and Alabama. Like ever since Manziel pulled off that win early in the in the tens, the two, twenty tens, it, there's always been a little extra in this game ever since then, and it feels like there is even even now. So when they have I, the key to A and M winning this game is they need to keep Jalen Miller in the pocket and they need to cover deep. Mm-hmm make him an intermediate and a short game passer and he's not going to have the patience to do it he's going to end up throwing some interceptions and get some turnovers and end up winning this game um it's a two and a half point spread i think that i think that the aggies end up winning by three going with okay going with the aggies i i think i think it's close though it is close and i'm going the same way i think it will be close i'm going to go bama 28 24 bama 28 24 i got the Aggies. I'm going to say 27-24 Aggies. I think it'll be. I think it'll be close. It's a low spread. It's a low um, uh, total too. I think the total is only like 45, 46, something like that. So I think we're anticipating a lower scoring matchup in, in the grand scheme of college football. 27-24 mm-hmm. is pretty pretty low. So uh, let's get to some baseball playoffs real quick before we get out of here. Um, like I said, a lot on the a lot on the rundown today. Um, uh, yeah. How impressed were you with the Rangers? this week against the uh against the rays very because their pitching really carried them jordan montgomery has been lights out his his past handful of starts nathan evaldi came out the next day too you know he's been battling back you know from an injury and he pitched extremely well also really helped out the bullpen nasty nate um so yeah showed up again in in the playoffs which um and it's big because that two games, Bochi talked about it after. It's like, hey, we, we finally get a day off and everybody can kind of get a chance to get their legs under them, their arms rested up. So both teams are, are ready to go. Um, I'm, I'm excited for this game against Baltimore because or these, this series against Baltimore, both these teams split. It was 3-3 in the regular season. It was pretty much even as far as, far as runs scored and all that kind of stuff. So uh, this DS should be really, really fun. I think it's going to be a really entertaining series. Um, the Astra, or excuse me, we'll get to them in a second. The Orioles just lost their closer, who, so it's going to... Bautista? Really? Yeah, they lost their closer, and now they have... Or it was Yiner Cano or Bautista. One of the two is out for the season. Wow. Uh, well, they had the... Yeah, they had the... Uh, uh, I mean, the one two combo at the end, the right. setup man and the closer, they lost their closer for the, for the rest of the season. Well, and to be fair, Cano, whichever one it is, Cano or Batista, both have had really good seasons uh, for, for the Baltimore bullpen. Um, they've, they've got some arms in there, too, that just come in and light it up, light up the radar gun. And they have starters that can go deep. Bradish has been really good. He's I've seen he's kind of getting some Cy Young consideration even a little bit. So, yeah, Batista is, to- is getting Tommy John. OK, so. That's a huge plus for the it's Rangers just, oh, absolutely. because that dude, he is a mountain of a man because it's like he is six eight, has the broadest shoulders I've ever seen, and he, the dude throws gas. So it's like 101, 102. And also, if you're going through the list and you're like, all right, where does where do the Rangers have the edge and where do the Orioles have the edge? If you're putting checks and minuses next to everything, the biggest check of on the entire list was Orioles – big check in bullpen over yeah. the Rangers. Yeah. Because that's the Rangers Achilles heel. It and, is. And, and it has been all season. It has been. And and so when you're putting kind of taking that check and making it like, you know, a little smaller, they still have a better bullpen, but right. their biggest advantage just turned a little bit less. So I think it'll be even more of an entertaining series that even if the Rangers are down by two, three runs going into the sixth, seventh, eighth inning, they can still come back and win one of these games. And they've and they've done that. They haven't had too many comeback wins, but they did show a lot of fight in the regular season where if they were down, they could come back and score and make it competitive. Something else that really impressed me during this Tampa Bay series, aside from the pitching, was just the approach that the batters had at the plate. I felt like in Seattle, they were really pressing, just trying to do too much because it was just like, okay, if we win two, we can you know get that by and advance to the DS and not have to worry about it. In Tampa Bay, it was 
patient. They waited. They mm-hmm. worked the counts. They worked up those those pitch counts for the Tampa Bay starters, got to the bullpen. If they can have that same approach, one through nine, Josh Young and Evan Carter, the rookies for the Rangers, have been uber impressive in the playoffs. So it's if, if they can keep that same approach against Baltimore, wear them down, get to that bullpen early, I, I would give Texas just – that that would give them a shot to win this. Speaking of uh... – Hats off to Josh Young and Jordan Westberg. I mean, having two San Antonio kids in the the ALDS is awesome. And then you have two Texas teams in the ALDS. Do you think – so give me predictions real quick. We're not going to get too much in the Astros playing the Twins. Um, I think that the Astros and the Rangers both win their series. Yeah, okay. Um, I I see them both going four or five games – but both of these series, so it'll be interesting. Um, of course, me being a Rangers fan, I'm going to hopefully hope that the Rangers can pull it right. out in advance. The Astros series, man, oh, my gosh, that's interesting I because s- they, have, they have the championship pedigree. They do. They've they've had the experience. They've been there before. You got Justin Verlander going in game one, followed up by Framber Valdez. You can't ask for a better one-two punch. That would put you in a really good position, win those two games, and it's like, all right, all we got to do is win one out of three. Right. Um, g- doing that in Minnesota is going to be tough because that crowd in Minnesota is ridiculous, and Minnesota's a good ball club too. They've got a really good pin. Johan Duran, he's also like a Bautista where he just he comes in and throws gas, 102, and it looks effortless. Right. It's just ridiculous. Uh, of course, there's the fun storyline of Carlos Correa coming back and playing in Houston, but they've got – so many other guys on on the twins uh royce lewis who just burst onto the scene you know hitting two home runs in his postseason debut and everything it's going to be a lot of fun in in that houston series too um i think the twins could sneak out of there really you know it, it's it's possible i'm on record as saying i think houston goes to the world series so i hope they don't <laughs> <laughs> i mean uh, how fun would it be though to have an all Texas championship series? That's like that's like Chuck's oh, wet yeah. dream. Yeah, like uh, he's, he's he's he can't wait for that. That would be awesome. And yeah. and I every baseball fan would look forward to it. Of course, it you know, Texas would just go berserk. Oh, absolutely. Um that's the last thing I had on the rundown, but I saw something coming in and we have a couple of minutes before I hit the the record or the uh the time that I didn't want to hit. So did you see the interview with Al Michaels that he has never eaten a vegetable? I haven't seen it, but I saw that, and it's just kind of like, how do you go through life without eating one vegetable? He, I mean, there, I will not touch green beans for the life of me, but it's just like, uh, come on, like broccoli, asparagus, peppers, and and things like that. It's like you got, I mean, you got to have some vegetables Al in Michaels your life. Is come on, seventy eight years old. I, I'm I'm calling BS card on that. <laughs> like, but uh, here's my question: Does he consider potatoes a vegetable? Because like he's a That's big. Not, it's he's, not a vegetable. It is a vegetable. But what what does it give you? It's, See, but <laughs> it's a starch. It's a starch. It's nothing. What does it There's give no you? nutritional value, really. Not much. <laughs> I mean, but like I, I I would wonder if he considers a starch or a potato a vegetable because like he eats, sure he he eats steak all the time. So like, how do you have steak without potatoes for seventy eight years of your life? I'm sure. Yes, I'm sure he considers a potato a vegetable, but I I think there's a lot of dietitians and and people out there in the health sphere that would maybe disagree with al michaels on i think half of the dietitians in the world just threw up in their (laughs) mouths when they when they heard this whole interview did you hear how repulsed he was at the thought of a carrot like he was carrots that's another one that's the the interviewer i forgot who it was it's a a cnn guy he interviewed him and he was like so let's let's go to one of the least objectionable vegetables i don't know like a carrot and al michaels was like a carrot's not a least objectionable that looks horrible he's like it just looks like it tastes bad did you ever get i was told all the time growing up like eat your carrots they'll help your eyes yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) yes i was told that all the time here i am with glasses right carrots all the time right but i don't just like gee thanks thanks thanks, y'all yeah (laughs) thanks mom uh yeah but apparently uh al michaels gets paid 15 million some odd dollars a year he's one of the most prominent broadcasters of all time and during halftime they set aside they make him a steak and he has eight minutes to have a steak dinner during halftime of all of his broadcasts what a life i guess you never have to eat a vegetable and look who you can become i'm now waiting for al michaels to do the voiceover for the jolly green giant next (laughs) i think that's the next move here 
You think so? You think yeah, that's, it's that's just all it's, it's all a head fake to just be like, no, I I love vegetables actually, and now. <laughs> I'm subbing in for the Jolly Green Giant. I thought that he was going to come out and like be a spokesman for Jimmy Dean or something. You know? I mean, that could possibly <laughs> happen as well, too. You know, it's just, yep, have have fun having steak uh, along with an angioplasty. <laughs> well, I mean, like, what does he have with the steak if it's not very vegetable? <sighs> See, that's... Mac and cheese? Well, yeah, that so probably goes with really like, again. really going to have the angioplasty. Ag- <laughs> right, again, it's like you need to balance it out a little bit, I think. What about, you know? f- I wonder if he eats fruit. I don't know. I got Someone get Al on the phone. There we go. Um, <laughs> that's all we got for you today. Damn, hitting, my, hitting the hour mark right now. Look at me go. Um, that's all we got for you today. Biggest weekend I can remember for Texas sports in a long time. Like, all of it on one weekend is just crazy. It's going to be fun. Everybody enjoy it. Absolutely. And Don, Chuck, and I will be back on Monday. Break down all of it. Remember, you can get this podcast wherever you get your podcast. And on YouTube, please download, rate, review, subscribe, unsubscribe, resubscribe, give some feedback, give us a five-star rating if you want, if you can, if you don't, you know, that's fine too. Uh, We'll see you on Monday right here on Sneakers and Cleats podcast. Boomer. Sooner. (laughs) See you later.